Well, thank you so much for, for the warm welcome, and thank you for taking your lunch hour to come and, and be with us today. It's truly really, um, a, a very, uh, it, it's, it's a wonderful moment for me to be able to do this today. So the talk I have for you today has a lot of moving parts in it, and so I thought I would start with um, kind of a, a place marker, a way forward to uh, give you an idea of, of where we're going on this journey. Uh, so we'll talk about placemaking and my place as an anthropologist, my roots, um, so to speak. We'll move through a little bit of Appalachian biodiversity and environmental health issues in Appalachia um, and make sense of health disparities in Appalachia, hopefully weaving all of this together um, as a way to synergize human and environmental health issues in the region. So I, I chose this picture because sometimes as a researcher, I feel like I'm standing on the edge of a cliff with nowhere to go. There is so much laid out before me, but I can't figure out how to get down to it. Um, and so what I have today is kind of my thinking of how I'm trying to piece together a lot of pieces um, of my background and my training from biological sciences to anthropology to women's and gender studies. And we'll see what happens as, as we go along. It's an adventure. <laughs> so while most of you are, are likely familiar with the idea of Appalachia as a region, as a mountain range, perhaps as a people, um, we know that it's, it's a geographically defined region in these ways. It's, um, as you, and I don't think the pointer was working, but um, you can see the Appalachian Mountains in the, in the purple. Um, it's one region within the United States, so it's, it's not isolated, it is connected to other places. It is also a politically defined region, and in the map uh, to the right, you see the Appalachian Regional Commission political boundaries that were established in the 1960s. Um, and it was here that Appalachia was solidified in the political naming and remapping, and in a sense, a recreation of the region. Um, it is defined by the Appalachian Regional Commission uh, as 205,000 square miles, 420 counties across 13 states. But what I want to talk about today in terms of place, I want to think of place a little bit differently. I understand placemaking to have many forms. For one, placemaking is the construction of geographical spaces and boundaries that we see on, on, on the maps, these cartographic lines that perform political organization and justification for separation. Placemaking also works as social construction of status, of social value, including access to necessary resources and the ability to protect oneself or your group from harmful exposure to danger, such as toxins. Ultimately, placemaking is a process of othering. And we see this process repeating in dichotomies that we become used to, uh, dichotomies that serve to separate, to limit the way we, we think and the way we interpret what we see, from region to region, from gendered beings, and from nature to culture. These are common binaries that we're used to thinking in. The importance of place is central to Appalachian studies as it requires us to work within contextual frameworks and interconnections between ideas and to think of the realities of the local and the broader national and geographic regional spaces. So it is through a, a critical regional studies uh, perspective that we see how regions become actively constructed as a space, as something we can change, we can touch, we can feel. Places feel different when you travel. Um, and we can use this as a rhetorical tool. It is used for difference making, but what if we find other ways to use place? So we see the remapping of social boundaries through place making between groups of people and places for political distinction that has been used for many purposes throughout history. Um, but it's also become part and parcel of neoliberal economic transformation. Ultimately, what I want to think about today is how place matters and how people experience health, both human health 
and environmental health. And this is particularly clear in the Appalachian region. So here I will consider the broader implications of Appalachia as a health disparity region um, and a region of deteriorating ecological environments. While human and environmental health issues too often occupy separate disciplinary spheres of research and dialogue, interdisciplinary and regional studies approaches to health of many kinds offer new avenues for analysis, helping to unmask these linkages between nature and culture. So the story I want to share today is a critical regional and anthropological approach to rethink how place matters for health, specifically ways of addressing co-occurring health crises found within the region of health and the natural environment. So ultimately, by, by the end here, um, I will argue that an ecosyndemic framework helps us to unmask placemaking by revealing the forms and processes of health disparities and environmental justice violations in the region. So ultimately, that's where we'll go. We'll see if we can get there. So what is my place? So my place and positioning, how we're trained, how we think, what we do, also matters. So my work as a medical anthropologist um, is framed in a critical medical anthropology approach um, to understanding health disparities and inequities among groups. Um, I describe it in terms of biopolitical dynamics of health disparities. So we have the need to look for the production or the cause of disparities. For the presentation, what are the effects? How do people respond? What do they experience? And to look at activism. What are the behaviors? What do people do to address problems and try to affect change? So in particular, my work has been in central Appalachia, um, in eastern Kentucky, uh, West Virginia, and southern Ohio. Um, and, and it has described access to healthcare in rural and metropolitan areas as linked with lack of, uh, lack of or proximity to healthcare facilities and <coughs> providers, as well as financial barriers, including cost of care, health insurance policy. Um, and the framework my research takes really asks these questions. So how are disparities shaped by social location, economic change, political activism, policy and region, so the production. What are the lived experiences of health disparity and health care inequality, um, the presentation, and what do people do? What is their agency to secure health and access to resources? And this is the activism portion. So this is kind of the overarching um, list of, of questions I ask as I go through different projects. So a um, couple of examples in working with the Frontier Nursing Service, you're probably familiar with the nurses on horseback in eastern Kentucky, Leslie County. So um, this was uh, began by Mary Breckenridge in the early 1920s, and I did interviews with nurse midwives and nurse practitioners who worked through Frontier Nursing Service in eastern Kentucky from the 1950s to 1970s. Yes, some of them that rode the horses, they were able to talk about uh, the transition when they were um, able to acquire used Jeeps from the Army uh, to go up creek beds because there were no roads. So you had to have a horse or a Jeep to get to some places. So this was looking at issues of access to care through problems with terrain and, and relative isolation. Although they were not isolated, um, it was difficult to get places and could take days to walk or ride a horse to get to the train to get somewhere. So this was uh, certainly an issue. We also talked about um, issues of childbirth and maternity care and public health and class relations between women in the region who were patients and the nurse midwives who came from elsewhere, often other countries including um, England at first. And so what, what these differences meant for uh, providing care. I also worked with labor unions in eastern Kentucky and West Virginia, looking at the issues of collective bargaining for gaining health benefits for workers and their families. So this allowed me to look at disparities among employer-sponsored health insurance programs. So if you have health insurance through your work, 
That's an employer-sponsored program, but they're not all the same. So different costs, different benefits, uh, different coverages, and so what this means and how um, union members use collective bargaining to try to get better access to care for their families. And so what I was able to do, um, this was at the beginning um, when the Affordable Care Act was being debated, I was in the field, and so I was able to contextualize some of the, the arguments for and against the Affordable Care Act based on the lived realities of people in this region. So from my work, I look at the long-term regional studies and how they reveal holistic patterns. So first, access to health care as a disparity is regional. There are differences from region to region. It is contextual. It is historical. It changes over time. And it is different among groups within one region. So the, the nurses on horseback, the frontier nursing service stories were about lack of providers, facilities, travel, um, you know, it was cost of care, so you were given care whether you could pay for it or not. People would uh, maybe do some work for the, for the service and do things, so no one went without because they couldn't pay for it. From the labor unions, we looked at economic transformation and what the loss of jobs and union hostility and other things meant uh, for affordability and how they um, would think about insurance as a safety net and talk about what good insurance was versus bad insurance. And, and so um, these are all access to care issues, but there are different sets of issues for different people, different groups across time. And so this is the holistic way of thinking about it. So ultimately, I would say this urges us to re-examine how the crisis in healthcare and public health approaches are also regional or should be regional, how they are contextual, and how they are changing in patterned ways. So things don't just happen, they're embedded in what's happening politically, historically, and we can predict in some ways and come to understand. All right, so now for something completely different. Right, my Python fan. So, Having set up the idea of, of place and my place in it and how I have thought about health a bit, I want to broaden that a little bit and have us look at Appalachian biodiversity. So set us up for talking about environmental health. So the Appalachian region is exceptional for biodiversity counts. The, top, the topography is quite complex. We have a very long mountain range. That, that has a lot of latitude and longitude uh, changes in it. So you get um, elevation changes that mimic um, latitude changes. It gives us overlap of northern and southern species in places that would not always be expected. Deep river gorges give us stable microclimates. We have isolated mountaintops that give us island effects and genetic diversification. And the age of the mountain range itself, almost half a billion years, gives us a long time for speciation. So Appalachia is recognized as a biodiversity hotspot. And I have this screenshot from the Appalachian Landscape Conservative Cooperative. Um, so integral to this dis discussion is an understanding of the importance of Appalachia as one of the world's most important sites for biodiversity. This approximately half a billion year old mountain range, you know, like we said, has complex topography, various ridges, steep slopes, gorges, wide valleys and lots of biomes within this. So the mountains are home to over 6,300 plant species, 250 bird species, 78 species of mammals, 58 reptiles, and 78 amphibians, and we're still counting. So let me share a few photos from the region to emphasize um, the ecological diversity of the region. 
So since we're in Tennessee, might as well start with the Great Smoky Mountains. Um, it is designated as a United Nations World Heritage Site and an International Biosphere Reserve. It has the greatest biodiversity of all United States national parks. It's a big deal. It's also the most visited uh, national park according to National Geographic. It gets over 10 million visitors annually. That's double that of the Grand Canyon, which often comes as, as a surprise. We have a lot of different biomes within Appalachia. We have cove forests. These are humid, low elevation hollows and ravines. So we have a lot of tree species that are able to coexist here. Shrubs, hemlock and oak are our climax species. And of course, we ha you have to show a black bear whenever you have the chance. So, this is just to give you an idea of what some of these areas look like. We also have transition woods. Mixed hardwoods and pines, once dominated by the American chestnut, you can see in the photo the enormous size, and unfortunately we lost these um, with the blight in the early 1900s. Um, diverse wildflowers, so trillium and sarvisberry and pink lady slipper. Anybody been up to Lady Slipper Loop on Buffalo Mountain? Say hello. We also have spruce fir forests. Uh, these are cold, snowy ridges, um, black spruce, red spruce, and balsam fir in the northern part of the Appalachian Range, red spruce and Fraser fir in the south. So you think Christmas trees. We also have an alpine tundra in the very northern part, and we don't think about this as being part of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, the trees are more elfin, matted black spruce, paper birch, low stature plants, lots of uh, sedges and lichens. And then to end very close to home uh, with our biomes are the, the balds. And a fantastic example is up on Roan Mountain. So these, uh, you have treeless heath or grass balds. We have these glorious rhododendron um, fields up on Roan Mountain. So, uh, from the pictures, the idea is to give you an example of, of the biodiversity throughout the mountain range. That, it, that although we talk about the Appalachian Mountains, they are quite different depending on where you look and, and what these ecosystem looks like. And they have very different needs. So to switch gears just a little bit, I want to think about Appalachia. And I'm going to talk about it as a politicized environment. So the importance of Appalachia for the global energy sector is undeniable. Uh, from the long history with timber and coal mining and now with natural gas, uh, it has undoubtedly been the backbone of, of fossil fuels for America for some time. And I'm using the term politicized environment quite intentionally here uh, to acknowledge the role of power relations as a source of environmental debate. And this is following uh, Richard et al. 2005. Uh, following this, it's clear that addressing environmental pollution and degradation in the region involves many local, national, and global voices. So we've, we've seen the glories of, of the biodiversity and what is here. So now what's happening to this really special, unique global region? So from a natural science and, and conservation perspective, it's clear the environment is suffering extreme damage. Uh, the most obvious is through mountaintop removal, um, at least currently, uh, which removes mountains for easier access to coal streams while filling streams and valleys with debris, the overfill. Um, toxic runoff from the mountain sites pollutes water supplies um, and leaves many communities, many families without clean, safe water for drinking, cooking, or bathing. And so what I wanted to show with this slide was this kind of dichotomy that we're used to thinking about with Appalachia, this beautiful, pristine, natural, wild space represented in one photo, and the state of disrepair, of despair, with loss of jobs and crumbling factories 
and sites left quite polluted with no, no cleanup and what this means for communities. So we're quite familiar with Appalachia as, as a region of poverty. That's how it is usually first re represented. Um, lack of jobs. Issues with nutrition and food security. Um, education, we have you know, uh, fewer students graduating high school and college than other regions, which feeds into problems with jobs and attracting jobs and keeping jobs. Um, problems with rurality, and being rural does not, is not a bad thing. It does not make one poor, but it can cause problems with access to resources, particularly if transportation is a problem. A, a new problem we have is, is broadband access that helps uh, we take it for granted when we're on our phones daily and, and on the internet, but if you don't have access to broadband, things that everyone expects you to be able to do, simple things like paying bills um, or, or registering for various things, for, for school, things for work become uh, insurmountable for folks. So these are some of the issues that, that are there and very worthy of long discussions. Um, today, we're honing in on environmental degradation and, and health disparities. So the photos here um, are kind of going to show us our, our, our change as Appalachia is a site of energy production. So these are a couple of, of sites from Tennessee. Um, we have um, Big Lost Creek in Polk County, southeastern Tennessee, um, on the right. And if you can, can see, the photo is a little bit um, a little bit old, and so it's not super clear. Um, but, but the logging. So we have train carts full of logs and, and trees just down everywhere. So um, these clear cutting issues that get wood out fast, but really causes a lot of problems, um, destroys ecosystems and causes um, soil loss and runoff and other kinds of things. Um, and the other one we have uh, the area around the copper smelter um, in, in Tennessee, Copper Hill. Um, and so the landscape around it is so polluted from the toxicity that it was barren uh, for a long time. Um, so these are a couple of local examples. Um, in eastern Kentucky, West Virginia, uh, we have mountaintop removal mining, and so this is quite literally blowing off the tops of mountains for easier access to coal. Um, so then it's, it, the, the, um, the excess is just pushed down the mountain and it fills in streams. Um, so environmentalist conservationists sound alarms because this destroys a lot of, of habitats, a lot of ecosystems. Um, in Appalachia we have because of, of the age and island effects and speciation, a lot of species um, can be wiped out quite easily um, by these effects. Another problem with, with coal are the coal ash spills. So uh, the ash has to be stored somewhere. It's quite toxic. Um, problems with regulation, so proper storage, these things do leak. And a couple of fairly recent major leaks here in Tennessee, so TVA's Kingston uh, uh, ash dam uh, spilled into the Emory River in 2008. And then uh, Duke Energy in North Carolina spilled into the Dan, to the Dan River in 2014. So um, although we have ways in place to to contain these, to store these, clearly they don't always work. And, and the problems with, with water toxicity are quite a problem. And the most recent is natural gas, so fracking. And this is a slide from um, Wetzel County in West Virginia. And so the restrictions on where a well can be placed in proximity to homes and schools is quite alarming. It's, it's you know, um, in some cases a matter of feet. And so you can, people have reported these uh, large 
fire plumes. You can look out your window and, and see it there. So concerns with what's in the air, but concerns with what's in the water because the fracking process also pollutes groundwater. And so if you can light the water in your kitchen on fire, it should give you pause, right? And these photos are from Appalachian Voices. So, what happens to the environment is one issue. What, if, what does this have to do with health disparities in Appalachia? So let's see if we can make a link. So Appalachia has been called a health disparity region. And a health disparity can be viewed as a chain of events signified by differences in environment and access to and utilization of and quality of health care, um, health status, um, or a particular health outcome that deserves scrutiny, you might say. Um, so when a disparity is determined to be not only unnecessary, but also unavoidable, it may be seen as unjust. And this is typically when a disparity becomes an inequity. Uh, and this clearly places an ethical judgment on the issues in question. So what's going on? So if you remember the, um, the map we saw of Appalachia at the beginning, and you look at the states shaded in blue, guess what? It almost exactly lines up showing you the Appalachian region. And the blue states, the dark blue states there, are the bottom quartile for chronic disease index. That means they're not doing so well. Now these are uh, looking at chronic diseases, non-communicable diseases. Um, lots of things go into this. So clearly biological factors um, play a part in this. So do social conditions, so social status, stress, access to resources, and health care. But what we really don't think about enough in, in social science and in public health are really these links with environmental exposures. There is science, there's a lot of work being done on that, but we're not publicly talking about these links a lot. So what does region have to tell us? What is the natural environment and what about these toxins that we're exposed to? So thinking holistically as an anthropologist, I understand health does not exist simply as a biological phenomenon. Many factors influence health, disease, risk, morbidity, and mortality. These include the social conditions, um, region, natural environment, and all of our exposures. And so, it is less well understood in terms of their roles in creation of disease risk and how this translates for people. Um, but as described in a recent report by the Appalachian Regional Commission, this was actually August of 2017, um, they say, and I quote, every mortality indicator is higher in the region than in the nation overall. Heart disease is 17% higher, cancer is 10% higher, COPD is 27% higher, injury 33% higher, stroke 14% higher, diabetes 11% higher. So if you consider broadly, you consider death broadly, something called the years per life lost, a measure of premature mortality, it is 25% higher in the Appalachian region as a whole than the nation. That is something to think about. So what are some of the health disparities that we have? Um, we can think about them in terms of access to care, you know, access and, you know, quality and quantity of hospitals and providers. Um, a, a problem that is in the making is the closing of rural hospitals in, in the past few years and how this is actually increasing problems of access and disparities for rural America, but particularly in rural Appalachia. Problems with transportation do still exist in many places. Affordability is increasing, increasingly a problem. Elder care in our region and drug abuse are two disparities that 
are in the news pretty frequently. Um, specific disease incidents and mortality rates, well, there's quite a list, asthma, birth defects, um, cancer, COPD, uh, diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. And so just a, a note on, on birth defects. So we, there are, are clear links between the rise in birth defects around people living near mountaintop removal sites. Um, and so, but what happens in, in, the, in the public dialogue is, oh, birth defects in Appalachia. They're all marrying their cousins. So we use stereotypes to dispel real factors and to not look at what's happening. So this is a graph from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation showing uh, the potential um, year's life lost. And what I want you to think about is although almost all of those states in Appalachia were blue for being in, in the bottom quartile um, for, um, for chronic disease, when we look closely county by county, it is not uniform. So even within a region, we have to think about diversity and what's happening. Some counties are quite fine. They're, they're in the white, they're doing okay. Um, other counties, these dark blue counties are clustered together in different places. And so when we talk about Appalachian health, it's also not fair to talk about it monolithically. We have to break it down and start looking at what's happening. So rather than being a region apart or the other America, Appalachia serves as a mirror for the nation, really as well as the effects of global neoliberalism. And it allows us to trace the processes of difference making that lead to disparities, including um, neoliberal expansion and natural resource extractive industries. In truth, the Appalachian region tells us the story of of America, of industrialization, but it's the story of globalization. Going back over 500 years from looking at, at uh, the first Europeans coming in and um, what happens with Native Americans, what happens with the environment after that. Uh, so we have a wake of economic and environmental devastation that's been happening for decades or for, for centuries. So Appalachians, like Americans, are navigating shifting cultural and political economic landscapes, much of which can be measured as cultural embodiment in terms of health. So what we see happening, these trends in culture and economics and politics, we can follow this by looking at health statistics. It is in this way that Appalachia helps to tell the story of globalization through examining social, political, and economic contests context and the processes that create and uphold these disparities. What we have in Appalachia are co-occurring environmental and public health disasters. These maps overlap quite clearly. So the important question is, how do we gain meaningful understanding of place-based health and environmental disparities? How do we start to put the pieces together? So to answer this question, I'm going back to my roots, my women's studies roots. How about that? Um, so feminist anthropologists have greatly influenced my ways of thinking. And a couple of examples, we have Sherry Ortner, who challenged binaries of man, woman, nature, culture, as products um, of culture themselves. And if we take the idea that we often work through false binaries, um, and we start to break that apart. We find new pathways before us. We find ways to get off that cliff. Um, second is Michelle Rosaldo, um, who continues to inform my thinking through her assertion regarding the potential for interpretive frameworks to limit our thinking. Uh, she is a reminder for me to continually ask questions and to ask why I'm asking a particular question. Um, because if we ask the wrong questions, we never get to the answer and we don't get anything meaningful. So from their works, I take inspiration and directive in continuing 
their journey as I create my own, unmasking difference and reconsidering place. So today I apply their teachings and seek to break down these false binaries and direct my investigation toward the problems of place-based disparities. Now you might be saying, okay, we kind of get Ortner and Rosaldo, but why are we gonna talk about chimpanzees in Africa? Hmm. So a another inspiration uh, for me comes from Jane Goodall, who is another anthropologist, she's a paleontologist, um, who has made a 50-year career working with chimpanzees in Africa. Um, so she's an inspiration because while human and environmental health issues too often occupy separate disciplinary spheres, um, it's interdisciplinary and regional studies approaches that can help us find new ways to overlap, places where they overlap. Um, so what Jane Goodall offers here is her deep concern with, with what has happened to chimpanzees over the years. She's seen their, their populations decimated. And why? Well, their forests have been decimated. But why? Because people clear the forests for land to grow food because they're hungry, because of increasing uh, desertification, um, uh, migration patterns change, so we have people moving from place to place um, because of war, because of politics, because of lots of things. And so what does this mean for the land? We, we see this, this happening with, with chimpanzees, but what, what Jane Goodall teaches us that, well, if you want to save the chimps, you got to save the people too. So her message is you have to look at both together. Um, and she's done remarkable things over the years. Um, she, the, she has her own institute, the Jane Goodall Institute. And she began what is called the, the Take Care Program. Um, it's the Lake Tanganyika Catchment Reforestation and Education Project that she began in 1994 in the Gombe National Park. And by talking with people, talking with farmers about their needs. They weren't initially interested in conservation because they were too busy trying to get food for their families. So listening to real problems on the ground, she and, and her institute helped with solutions. And so by helping alleviate some of the food needs, farmers are able to set aside some of their land for reforestation. So they are rebuilding the forest, rebuilding corridors so the chimps can now move and not be genetically isolated and their numbers are growing. So it's helped the chimps, it's helped the people, it's helped the land. And this is a model I find um, very, very uh, powerful. She also has the Roots and Shoots Institute um, that is taking conservation into the schools. It's in about 95 countries to have kids look at issues with the land, with the environment, and with human needs, so there is potential to learn from that. So I think the ultimate point I wanna make with that is that the health of people and of the environment are fundamentally entwined. And to save one, we have to save both. This means new ways to think and ask questions about the environment, about health, about economic stability, about sustainable development, and what constitutes community. So this slide is showing us deaths from chronic cardiovascular disease from 1999, 2007, and the red are the sites of mountaintop removal coal mines that overlap quite convincingly with some of the dark blue counties where we have cardiovascular disease. And there are um, you know, scientific uh, research that has made these links with, with the chemicals and with other things. We also have the rise of um, black lung disease in areas around this. And it's not the miners who are getting it. There are very few miners. It doesn't take a lot of people to to do mountaintop removal, it takes a whole lot of really 
big machines, so few people to run the machines. But the communities that live around there are now inhaling this dust. And so we are seeing the rise of, of, of black lung resulting from this. One other one for you. Um, and here, mountaintop removal sites are in green, and so this is deaths from lung cancer. Uh, and the graph is from 2010. So I've listed a couple of, of articles here that are, are interesting that, that back up part of the story, um, looking at particulate matter. Um, studies from West Virginia University, they have folks that do a lot of really good work there. Um, mortality in Appalachian coal mining region, regions, Hendrix also does a lot of this work. Um, but some of the consequences for mountaintop removal, um, you know, it's increased hospitalizations uh, due to COPD, hypertension, uh, increased lung cancer, um, heart, lung, and liver disease, and overall, overall mortality rates. So when we start looking, there's a lot of research that's making these links. And so the problem is making the shift in how we, as a larger group, talk about this, how we think about people's health, public health, and health of the environment. Um, and as a, as a nod to activism, uh, there are several really amazing organizations in Appalachia. I Heart Mountains, or I Love Mountains, is one of them. And you can uh, go on here. They do a pretty good job um, keeping a running list of peer-reviewed um, research to help follow some of this. So I wanted to uh, acknowledge them within that. So how am I starting to bring these things together? Uh, back to medical anthropology. Uh, Meryl Singer in the 1990s uh, coined the term syndemics, and it's a biocultural and political economic framework that seeks to highlight negative and socially unjust conditions that result in the clustering of diseases and interaction of diseases in specific patterns. Um, that yield several diseases acting in tandem. So it's not just lung cancer that is, is a problem in these counties. It's not just heart disease. What you have are multiple diseases that are, are very uh, strongly beyond the norm with the national averages. Um, so this term syndemics yields some of the most notable um, epidemics in history, the Black Plague in Europe, smallpox and other disease outbreaks affecting indigenous peoples in North America, the 1918-19 influenza epidemic, and most recently, the global AIDS epidemic. Um, so these do not happen just because people are exposed to a biological vector. There are social and environmental conditions. You kind of get a, a perfect storm coming together. And so what's happening in parts of Appalachia is this perfect storm, this public health and environmental crisis, and they are feeding each other. So what, what this syndemics framework reveals are processes of interconnected chains of disease causality nested in particular political, economic, and biocultural environs. So this perfect storm idea. Uh, so syndemics, what, what's important, I think, is that it challenges us to move away from traditional biomedical models that typically, typically address disease on the individual level. You have this disease, therefore you should do this and this. It's looking on a much bigger level um, and connecting things in ways that we don't typically do because of the binary way we think. So, what about syndemics in Appalachia? What can we do here? Um, Appalachia offers a very clear regional case study for investigating these um, many ways in which the environment, and in particular forms of environmental degradation, um, serve um, in, in the service of energy extraction, serve to create and sustain a variety of non-communicable health conditions. Um, Clearly, primary care providers in direct patient contact cannot realistically address all of this. Um, 
but a syndemic approach helps us to provide, to think of actionable steps so that communities can, can rethink things. Um, and so in Appalachia, Appalachian studies helps fulfill requirements for a syndemic approach because we have recognition of the clustering of diseases with certain populations. We have the data, we can trace this. And we understand through, through decades of research in the region how social problems affect disease clusters. This region is very well studied and researched and there's a lot of, of things to pull from. So how are we bringing environment back in here? Um, a failing of critical medical anthropology um, is that until pretty recently, they have paid very little attention to ecological factors that influence health. Uh, more recently, um, Merrill Singer, who developed syndemics, has taken that next step um, with the extension of echo syndemics, providing a pathway for investigating disease interactions that are a product of climate and other environmental changes that are a consequence of human activities. So in particular, he points to respiratory diseases such as asthma, which are a very large problem in, in parts of Appalachia, especially with children, um, that asthma has become a global epidemic uh, and a global ecosyndemic linked to environmental and climatic changes. So it's not just Appalachia. There are places around the world. Um, so if you, if you look where natural resource, resource extraction happens around the world, you will see patterns of poverty and health issues that follow these. So they're quite traceable. Um, so what this does is also creates a space to include environmental justice within our public health collaborations. So I think the, uh, one of the major takeaways here is looking at these socially and environmentally unjust conditions and how they lead to the clustering of diseases and disparities, both health and human health and environment. So echosyndemics, I think, is a, a tool for analyzing place-based and co-occurring crises in health and environment. Um, for example, the links between proximity to mountaintop removal in central Appalachia gives us a good way to rethink elevated rates of lung cancer or heart disease and birth defects and make those links. So once, once those are, are strongly made, and, and I think they really are in the science now, it's, it's rethinking and, and different types of discussions um, that we need to have moving forward. Mm -hmm. And this allows us to synergize policy and action. So utilizing an ecosyndemic perspective helps to further analyze recent studies um, that make these connections. Um, it also helps us understand the region as a politicized uh, region uh, with, with man-made causes of, of disease. Um, so following a syndemic, ecosyndemic approach to the processes and causes of multivarying non-communicable diseases, we start to get a different way to think. This gives us different questions to ask. So while health disparities um, and inequities are largely linked to political economy, and clearly uh, the environmental damage is political economic with, linked with energy and, and jobs, um, we tend to put people in, in a false position, it's, it's either your health or a job. What if that binary is false? What if we can think differently and ask other questions? So what this does is give us spaces where we can have discussions overlapping public health and environmental health disparities, allows us a way forward to improve the health of people in place. It's a place for activism. It's a place for citizen scientists to get children involved, help them learn about their environment and the place they live in and about their health. They're remarkable little beings. I think they're smarter than adults sometimes. Uh, maybe they can figure it out. Um, but also ways to think about healthy community development that is not simply based on job numbers, but what it means to grow a community and sustain it in, in ways that are healthy. 
Thank you. So that, that's a great question. Um, I, I can talk a little bit about discussions I've had with health providers. Not, I haven't had these discussions in Tennessee um, in the past year, but from research in eastern Kentucky um, that has also experienced a lot of mergers. And what you see is just the, um, the, the complete going away of, of the single practice general physician. Um, they're bought out by hospitals so that they, they work for hospitals. And a problem that has come up um, is that when you get bought out, you, you sign a contract with this hospital. And you also sign a non-compete clause so that then, you know, uh, you can't work <laughs> within several, usually several hundred miles. Um, of this site, and so if if the conditions aren't good, if there's a problem with your work, um, then you can, as a physician, be unemployable um, in a lot of ways, and that is not part of the discussion that we're having. So um, a concern I have with with these large mergers is that it it moves toward monopoly, and there is no competition. Competition is not always you know, the best thing when you're thinking about health. Health is not a commodity um, like coffee and sugar, um, but, but it's treated that way w within the economic system that we use, the business model we use for health care. So um, I do have concerns about it, and it's usually, those mergers are usually in the name of efficiency. Efficiency means what for health care? <laughs> not always better care. It means a better business model, so... That's all I have to say on that. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I can give you an example of that. Uh, my primary care doctor oh. uh, was in a single physician mm -hmm. practice. So he was the only doctor there. And he got a letter from United Healthcare saying that starting January 1st, they would no longer consider him a provider. So all of his patients that had United Healthcare either had to find another doctor or find other insurance. So as a result, he had to shut down his practice and he now works in the ER. So there's sort of a mm. that uh, mm. seems to be a cooperation, you know, between the, the healthcare providers and their own insurance hopefully to pay. Um, it's it's really healthcare management. It, and, and the doctors, the physicians' voices are, are often missing from, from these debates. Um, and his option was yeah. to go work for a hospital. Yeah. 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 So that's a great example. Yes. I was curious about with the merger, it was sort of almost a way to try to keep a small world as president. Remember, most of the time in Virginia, there's a small town hospital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I don't I can't directly speak to to whether the merger results in closure of smaller hospitals. My guess is that that's a likelihood, um, but there's also the larger issue of if you look at states that did the Medicaid expansion with the Affordable Care Act versus states states that did and did not. You have a lot more rural health hospital closures in states that did not do do the expansion, um, and that includes Tennessee in that. So, you know, it's, it's about funding and profits 
and how this this works. Now, you know, granted, you know, I, I want I want my doctor to get paid well. I want, you know, it's not about denying them a, a good living by any means. Um, but you know, following the money trail and where does it go? Most of the money doesn't go to the health providers themselves. And and it's it's a bigger issue, but it's a good question. How do you see us giving up false binaries? Do false binaries are driven by capitalism, which makes up our psychological landscapes? Mm -hmm. So then you have to rethink capitalism, perhaps. Perhaps. Yes. Yeah, so it's a great question. How do we do it? Um, um, there's the idea of hegemony, that there are, there are ideas and ways of thinking that are hegemonic, that are so dominant, it's hard to think past it. But within any hegemony, there is resistance. Where there is power, there is resistance. And there are alternate ways to think through that. So um, there, there, are, there are other ways, perhaps, but it's, but it's difficult. And, and as an individual, how do you say, not going to do that anymore? You can't, and so it, it's the need for, for collective rethinking and looking for other ways. And I don't know that that helped you at all. But mm -hmm. <laughs> so. You mentioned at the beginning that there's lower cost of treatment, that's why it's like yeah. a mental lack of access to health care. So yeah. if people are educated about this, can we even get started even? You know, or like do you have higher cost of treatment or medical treatments? Should you have more doctors or do they come from that's a great question, and I can't give you definite numbers on that. Um, I think that uh, some, of, some of the programs like at ETSU and um, at Marshall in West Virginia have rural health as um, part of their foundation, and part of the idea is to take you know, people and, and train them so they will stay in local places. Um, you know, there's, nurses tend to stay where they are, but physicians tend to travel, and so there, there are, you know, there, there are class issues and gender issues to be considered within that as well. So it's a good question. So Tennessee the Green Medicaid Right. So people are hurt by that, and yet. Policies and programs that get reelected over one. So, so why is that? It's not in the same thing. I think like kind of thinking beyond the binaries. It's something else, right? Because if I can benefit from Medicaid expansion, why do I vote for this doctor who is representing me? So what? So what else is there? And within this complex that encourages people to vote against their own interests. Right. And. And, and that is a, a larger question, you know, than, um, than I can probably give a reasonable answer to. But, um, you know, if, if you think of, of how people vote and, and what matters to them, people vote, you know, on, on, um, on what they know, on, on values, on, on misinformation <laughs> sometimes. Um, and on stereotypes that, you know, I'm in this pickle, things are not so good, but they have stuff, so why do I have to pay for their stuff? And it's not looking at the bigger picture and, and devaluing of, of safety nets by devaluing people who utilize them. Um, and, and there's a, a lot of judgment in there as well, but, you know, it, it's, it's, the, the falling, um, you know, take home pay and or, or uh, extra, I'm not getting the right word here, um, expendable money. We, families don't have a lot of expendable uh, money and, and so, you know, it, it's a need to try to control and shore up resources and, and you know, belief systems and, and how you view the world all comes together in different ways. So. Again, not a really great answer to your, to your question, but. <laughs> well, I think, thank you so much for an important and timely and thought-provoking 
lecture. I think there's there's a lot more discussion that, that we want and need to have, but I want to be sensitive to your time. I see that it's one o'clock, and so let's give a, a round of applause again for Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.